Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too. And those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. Maybe a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. And there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object, which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets, and those rings probably combined and formed the Moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It's said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy object store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up. Take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. 
This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth, but it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the Sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away, and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees. And ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky. And their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky. And the impact with that thing 
will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the Sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the Sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the Sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the Sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the Sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the Sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the Sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too, either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else, since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. 
taking their speed into account, they both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun, apart from the star seeming more like a giant pitiless blazing ball in the sky. Its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the Sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the Sun, and even the presence of the Moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the Sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay? <laughs>